open Shem Spirit and Shefa Bili Dai and open all the gates of Panasa and Yeshua and Bisiyat Deshmaya and Bezat Hashabotai. Every word that we're going to study, every word that Zohar we're going to read, Bezat Hashim will be for the Atzlacha of the entire Kila that is here with us, Bezat Hashim. So may Akadosh Bokho open up all the gates and the merit of Rabbi Chaim Pito stand with us and protect us, Amen King Yatsu. In Abotai tonight, I have a special surprise that we didn't mention, but now it's a good time to mention it, Bezat Hashim. Tonight is not just going to be a class, but also Be'ezrat Hashem, we're going to be doing something very rare. What are we going to be doing? Now everyone is asking. We're going to Be'ezrat Hashem finish one of the Zohar. So we know Abotai that every single night, every shul that we do, every tefillah that we do, we always we give out pages of Zohar, that each one has the, 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 the opportunity to read a page and to participate with finishing the Zohar as a community. Baruch Hashem, we finished already four Zohars. So tonight, Be'ezat Hashem, always, whenever we start a new Zohar, I take the last page of Parashat Bereshit, and I remove it. So tonight, Be'ezat Hashem, we're going to read the last page, and we're all going to be coming and gathering together to finish the Zohar as a group of people, Be'ezat Hashem. May in that merit, of every page of the Zohar, and every word of the Zohar, which is Kodesh Kodeshi, bless everyone with all the Barachot, and fulfill all our hearts' wishes. Amen, Kinyat. You know, Be'ezat before we start this class, I was debating whether or not we're going to do a Zohar class, a regular class, how are we going to do it, Be'ezat Hashem? So what we're going to do tonight is going to be a class inspired by the Zohar Kaddish. So whoever wants Be'ezat Hashem for the deep Zohar classes, we Ramash, we go deep, now we're on the seven gates of, uh, of Tefillah. Whoever wants to do that, Be'ezat Hashem, we have the Shuri. Tonight it's going to be an inspired class from the Zohar Kaddish. But you know, Botei, since we are finishing the Zohar Kaddish, I would like to speak about the importance of the study of the Zohar Kaddush. And also, what is the Zohar Kaddush? You know, but a lot of times, the Zohar Kaddush is a teaching that is very unclear. Nobody really understands, nobody really sits and explains what is the Zohar. Are we allowed to study it? Are we not allowed to study it? What's its benefits? So that Be'ezat Hashem Abotai is something that's very important that I think we all need to know before we get into reading the Zohar. You know, Be'ezat Hashem, tomorrow we're all going to go and we're going to say we've been to a class where we spoke about Zohar, we finished the Zohar. And then may, uh, some people may ask questions. What is the Zohar? Are we allowed to study it? When are we allowed to study it? Who is it written by? So that Abotai is the first thing that I want Be'ezat Hashem to cover before we start. So now Abotai, the first level of understanding what is the Zohar is understanding, first of all, the, the build of our Torah. So we know, Abotai, that our Torah is bro broken into how many pieces? Three pieces. First piece, and I'm going to run by through this. First piece is Ikhtav, the written piece, the written, Zohar, the written Torah, which is Torah, Nivim, Ktuvim. The second piece is Torah Shebaal Peh, the Torah which is oral, which you hear it from mouth to ear, from mouth to ear, which actually was a Torah that was only allowed to be taught and studied by heart. Meaning, whatever I heard, I can teach, and whatever he heard, he can teach. But nothing was allowed to be written until Rabbi Udanasi. That is the written uh, Torah, which also is compiled of the Marot, the Mishnah, Alakha, ways of laws, the way we act. And the third piece to our Torah Kedusha is Torah Asot, which is what? The Torah of the Secret. Torah of the Secret is also known and also is uh, nicknamed as Kabbalah. Now we know about I, that the source and the base of the Kabbalah is actually what? Zohar Kadosh. With the first form of Kabbalah, when it was brought down to the world, it was brought down in the form of Zohar. That actually Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, like Rabbi Yehuda Anasi, was the first one that can actually teach this teaching. Because we, taught, we call it Torah Hasod, the Torah of the secret. So if it's a secret, only those who the secret is told, which what, that's what we call Kabbalah, which comes from the word what? Le Kabel, to receive. What you receive, that is the secret that only belongs to you. But Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai actually was the one that came and taught it and spread, and spread it around by writing and by bringing on the Zohar Kaddish. Mm -hmm. Now, but the question could be asked, of why was the Zohar Kaddish brought down from the first place? So Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai writes, black and white, in the Zohar, that the Zohar only has one purpose. And to go even further, Arizal even says that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the Tana, which is mentioned hundreds of times in the Gemara and our Torah is based on Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. He only came down to the world with one mission in mind of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. He was brought down to the world for what? To bring down the Zohar HaKadosh. So why is that? 
So it's very simple. It's said about that, that when Moshe Rabbeinu went up to Maron, when he went up to this guy, he saw future generations and he saw the last generation, which is our generation today, and he saw what the world will have to go through in order to clean the world, in order to prepare the world for the last redemption. So it's Ariza says that Moshe Rabbeinu, what did he do? And he brings the Tehidim, where it says, Alita la Maron, Shavita Shevi, lakachta matanot, bad. Well, what did Moshe Rabbeinu do? He went and he brought it down and he started the descent of the Nishama Bishom Bayuchai. Where it's even said that the Nishama Bishom Bayuchai was a level that it wasn't even supposed to come down from the first place. It was Abish Shimon that pulled it down. And that's what the Tehidim says. You went up to the sky and you brought hostage, Shevi. What is Shevi? It spells Shimon Bar Yochai. But actually, Rabotai, the teaching of the Zohar is a teaching that was meant and brought down for what? For the last generation. So if we go back now to the three chapters of our Torah, we see that they break to also three periods of time. First Torah, which is, no Rabotai, written, represents what? Represents the past. If we look at the entire Torah of the written Torah, it's all about the past. B'nai Israel, leaving Egypt, Adam Arishon, Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov. It's all about what happened in the previous generations. Of course, the Torah is always actual. We can always apply it in every generation. But it represents a time which is not our time. The second chapter of the Torah is Shebaal Peh, the Torah which is by heart. That represents what? Present. The present. Why the present? Because it's laws. How to act, what to do, when to do, Gemara, Alakha. So that represents right now. So if the written Torah represents the past and the oral Torah represents the present, so what does the Zohar represent? The future. The future. And that's exactly, Rabotai, the purpose of the Zohar, Kadosh. The Zohar was brought down with one purpose and with one thing in mind. For the last generation, for the generation of the Geulah. That the Zohar was brought in order to help the generation of the Geulah exit the Geulah with ease. Where it said that without the Zohar, Kadosh, Hashem Yirachem, where we would be today. Where the merit that the Zohar Kadosh brings to the world is it what keeps the world standing. And that Rabotai is simply the essence of the Zohar Kadosh. It's a Rabotai in the Zohar that actually the study of Zohar was forbidden for the first 5,000 years of the creation of the world. Where that Torah had no use for the first 5,000 years. <coughs> Meaning until, this is what the Zohar Kadosh says, until we didn't start counting 6,000 into the 6,000, the teaching of the Zohar was forbidden. Now a lot of people are going to say, what year are we today? 5,700. So if it's 5,700, the Zohar is not still, still uh, not permitted. No. We're counting it wrong. Like I always say, when a child, when he is just born, how many years is he? How old is he? Zero. So even though he was just born, his age is zero. When he finishes one year, and he starts the second year, how old is he then? One. So actually when the Zohar says that the, the teaching of the Kabbalah is only permitted for the 6,000 years, it's what? It's when we start to count into the 6,000 years. Not necessarily uh, 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 going into 6,000 more. 5,000 more. And that Abu is something amazing. That you see that the teaching of the Kabbalah, only in the last 700 years, started to be developed. We see that for 2,500 years, this entire teaching was non-existent. We're only, in the last 700 years, you have Arizal, you have Rabbi Nachman, you have Baal Shem Tov, you have Arasha, Sharam Chal. That only, after thousands of years of it being written, it starts to be taught. Why? Because it was only written for this generation. And that's about why it's so important that we all gather here today, we study the Zohar, we teach the Zohar, it is actually what brings the Geulah. It's the purpose and what will cause us to exit in from the exile and into the redemption with ease. Now, you know what I see? A big application of the Zohar Kadosh. Put aside the mirror that you receive. Put aside the bracha that the person uh, receives. Put aside the protection that he has. But actually, it is the cure for us, people who are hungry for the Torah in this generation. You know what I said in the Zohar Kadosh? That at the time of the Geula, Umala Aretz Adat. What did that mean? It means that the world will be full of what? Knowledge. Of knowledge. Where it says, Dor Dea. Generation of knowledge. Where the entire world, all knowledge that exists will be available to all. 
You know, but if you look today in the world, you see that any single thing that exists, you could know it in, in a matter of a, of a second. Think about any knowledge at the time, maybe you have to travel to the other side of the world to study. Today, in a matter of a second, you pull out your computer, your phone, and you have everything available to you. That today we are actually living in the generation of Dorda, of the generation of knowledge, the generation where people have this knowledge available to them. And you know, Abu Tai, when you're dealing with a generation of knowledge, you also need to act with them in a way of knowledge. You know, Abu Tai, one time I did a shiur for a group of young people, a group of, a, a, of a, a teenagers, you can even call them, I don't know if they were teenagers. And I thought it would be a very simple shiur. Because you think young people, young people are going to be easier to deal with. It was the hardest shoe that I did, I think, in my life. Because the question that they're asking, it's not questions. It's questions that, it's the one that choked the rabbi. The hardest questions. So one person got up and they said, you know, I have a question because I love to hear the questions of people. He said, you know, all this is beautiful what you're saying. But if all this is actually true, how come the entire world is not chasing this truth? So I told myself, I, I, I know why the whole world is not chasing this truth. So I told everyone, I'm going to ask each and every one of you a question. And I want everyone to do anything possible to receive the answer. There's no problem. I looked at the first one. How many feet are between us and the moon? Ridiculous question. He said, okay. Goes to his, to his pocket, pulls out the phone. You, how hot is the sun? You, how many gallons of water is in the ocean? You, how many this? Ridiculous questions. How many uh, liters of air is this in the world? And after I asked a million ridiculous questions, I said, okay, now answer. And you see this one says, the feet between us and the moon are five million, da, 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 da. The temperature of the ocean, of uh, the uh, sun is, da, 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 answer to everything. So after everyone has all these answers, I said, now I have a question. Does God exist? So they all said, okay, let's find the answer. The same way they found the previous answer, they're going to find this one. So they go there, does God exist? What's the result? No answer. A generation of knowledge. Now you know about that when you're dealing with a generation of knowledge, the only way to feed them, the only way to act with them is not by telling them quiet belief and walk. It's by giving them the knowledge, giving them the understanding. And that about that is if you ask me in my personal opinion, what we see, and all the classes we do is the biggest benefit the Zohar Kadosh gives us. Because it gives us a knowledge on our Torah and it gives us an understanding of our world in a way that we don't, we can't receive from any other place. You know, Abotai, we're so used to hearing from different drashot and from different classes the constant belief and walk, to put the feeling, do this, do this, do this. And when the simple questions come of why, we all get to, the, to, to a point where we say, why? We don't know really why, but you do it. A generation that is, has so much knowledge, a generation that every piece of knowledge that exists in, in the world is access, accessible to them, a generation like that, they're not going to be fulfilled. Satisfied with telling them belief. And that is what we see every single week with the class that we do of the Zohar Kaddush. Every week, what do we do? We don't just sit down and we teach Zohar and Kabbalah. We take a mitzvah. A mitzvah that we do every single day. Something that we're so used to doing it that we don't even ask ourselves why we do it, or what its benefits, or how to do it correctly, or why did Akadosh Baruch Hu ask us this mitzvah in the first place? And we break that mitzvah and we break that simple thing that we do so much, so often, and we're just taught to just do it without asking, and we give it meaning. And when you give a mitzvah meaning, you give it a body for someone to hold on to. Because now it's not just hearing, believing, and doing, but you give an understanding. Now, but I have a question. If I'm telling you to do something specific, I tell you two things. One that I explain to you, another one that I don't explain to you. Which one is more likely that you have the connection and have the, the will to get up and to do that action? The one we understand. And that about is why the teaching of the Zohar and the teaching of the Kabbalah in this generation is the most important teaching that we can possibly learn. That it is a teaching of Botai that it on a natural basis gives us sense to our Torah that we're taught every single day and gives us meaning to what we do. That it's not just a teaching where you get up and you leave, it's a teaching where you can take and put it into action. 
And Hatha Bhutta is the most beautiful teaching that you can study. Something that you take home with you. But you know about that, the Zohar Kadosh goes even further than that. It's not just a teaching that gives us knowledge, but actually a teaching of Bhutai that what all the Makubalim say, it breaks down the toughness and breaks down all the Kilipot in the language of the Zohar, which what is Kilipot? So as we know, throughout our day-to-day -day life, what happens to us? We're in a Shama that's sitting inside a body, sitting inside a suit, but we're in a world of what? Of impurity. So it's like Abutai, you take something and you, uh, and you uh, put it through uh, a world where there's a lot of dirt. What starts to happen to it? Layers and layers of dirt start to, to amass, accumulate. Those layers of dirt are actually like what? Like peel. That peel that we amass up on our neshama, on our body, on our heart, it's that peel that holds us back from getting up and actually doing what we want. It's, getting, it's stopping us from actually getting up and uh, running after our wishes. It's, getting, it's stopping us from actually getting up and chasing after the truth. And that abotai is what the Zohar Kadosh does. Where the fire, the Kiddushah of the Zohar Kadosh is the only thing that actually breaks down and destroys that toughness that we have in our heart. You know, Abotai Chacham Batsyon Shaul was one of the Achonim that lived in this generation. He was actually the Chavut Avavadia. And he didn't live 10,000 years ago. And he was a Posek Alakha. He was a man of Alakha. He wasn't even a man of Kabbalah, not a man of Zohar, complete Alakha. But he would always say, if you want to bring a young person back to Shuva, if you want to bring a young person to soften him, let him read Zohar. That just the fact that he reads the Zohar, that Zohar will break down all those layers of, of, of shell that he amassed on his Nishama. That in other words, the Zohar Kodesh says, by reading the teaching of the Zohar, one could uplift his Nishama to a higher level. And we know about that what we mentioned throughout all our classes, when one lifts his neshama down here, what hap uh, up there, what happens to him? Akadosh Baruch lifts his mazal, he lifts his, his position in shamay. Where a person can be blessed just by hiring his position of the neshama. And that about us, that is amazing. Arizal Akadosh says in the introduction to the teaching of the eight gates. So as we know, there's eight gates to the books of Arizal. Which are eight gates, which are all pure Kabbalah, which is the in-depth explanation of the Zohar Kadosh. So if we think the Zohar is deep, imagine the Zohar on a deeper level. It says there in his introduction to the gate of introduction, that he says, all oh, the pain, all oh, the sadness, I want to listen to this, all oh, the oni, poverty, all oh, the tzarot, all oh, the trouble that we deal with, all oh, the bad that one sees in his life is caused from one thing, from the lack of effort of the study of Chuchmat Azwa and Chuchmat Kabbalah. And something that we can all sit in the introduction. That it doesn't even say it comes from a lack of study. It comes from a lack of effort. That even that effort, that little bit that we touch, that little bit that we taste, is enough to clean our nishama, to clean our life from all the bad and all the trouble that we see. And that Abutai is the power of when we sit down and we study the Zohar Kadosh. You know Abutai, something that I also see that is also very important, that lat lat, every week when we do another shoe, another shoe, you see it more present. Where a lot of people, when they sign themselves in positions of whether if it's sometimes when you wake up and you say, you know what, I feel like I'm stuck. Or I feel like my mazal is blocked. Or I feel like as much as I work in Panasa, it's not working. Or uh, I feel like I have this, this uh, feeling of sadness around me all the time. When people find themselves in this position where they don't know how to act and they don't know how to, to deal, it, deal with it, what do they do? They often go to other Rabbanim and they rely on other Rabbanim to actually look at the person to try to find a solution for himself. Where we put our hands of our, not just our daily lives, we put our hands of our entire lives in the hands of someone else. The fate of our entire life we put in someone else and we say, in it, find me the solution. But, but, but I imagine we can all come to the point where we don't need to rely on someone else to find a solution for our problems in our life. That a person can just sit down and look at what he does on a day-to-day -day basis, look at what's missing and know how to act. Because he has a better understanding of his world and a better understanding of himself. And that Abutai is just a little bit 
of the blessings and the merit of a person that gets up and studies the Zohar Kadush and reads the Zohar Kadush. He understands it, he doesn't understand it. Like we were talking, means and a big and Rabbi Michael yesterday. We said, you know, it's beautiful, the Zohar Kadush, that as much as you go deeper and deeper and deeper in the teaching, you realize that as deep as uh, the deeper you go, you realize this entire teaching, this entire concept was where your entire life it was in your head. And you just needed someone to come and to polish it, someone to come and to clean it, in order for this entire world to be visible to you. And that Abutai is what is beautiful. You know, Abutai, now after the Shiur, we're going to give out the page of the Zohar. And I know a lot of people are going to ask, No, I'm reading it. I don't understand it. I don't understand Hebrew. And even those who understand Hebrew are going to say, It's not Hebrew, it's a very strange language. It's Aramaic. Why am I reading this? So now, Abutai, and this is where we truly see the value of the Zohar Kadosh, where it's Abutai, that there is no bigger happiness that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, this is in the Zohar Kadosh, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu receives in the world, then when his son, that is not necessarily in the level of studying Zohar, of studying Kabbalah, or not even maybe in the level of studying, reading clear Hebrew. The Zohar Kadosh says, when he, a son of HaKadosh Baruch Hu like that, gets up and tries to read the Zohar, and he's skipping the words, and he's mumbling, and he's not able to pronounce them, he doesn't understand them, and he's making a big Salat Matbukha from the reading, a person like that gives Hashem the most pleasure out of any person in existence. That it makes Hashem truly happy. So we can ask, why is that? Because Zohar Kadosh says, it's like, you know, a child. When we know when a child gets to the age of two, three years old, what does he start to do? He starts to try to talk. And when the beginning, when he's starting to walk and he's starting to talk, what does he do? He makes a mess out of the words. But even though he's not even pronouncing the words correctly, what feeling do the parents receive? They, feel, they have a feeling of happiness, they start to laugh, they hug him, they kiss him. Why? Because they see that he's trying. That he's trying to be like them, he's trying to walk in their path. A Buddha person who studies Zohar Kadush, his merit is above the merit of all. And that is why Abu Tai, it's so special about us and we're all gathered tonight, not just for Shiva, which is inspired by Zohar Kadosh, but also a finishing, a completing of the Zohar. And we can all, Bezat Hashem, go home and say that we're going to have Bezat Hashem peace of a complete Zohar together. Because you know, even if you read one page, one page of the Zohar Kadosh, and we finish the Zohar Kadosh, the, your merit is like you finish the entire Zohar Kadosh. Because your partners, maybe with many others, but your partners in what? And not just the reading of a page, but finishing of the entire book. So that Abutai is uh, just a little bit of an introduction before we're going to start our shiru. Uh, why Be'at Hashem? It's so special in met Tonight Be'at Hashem is the night of Kiddushah. That we will all Be'at Hashem drag this Kiddushah, not just for tonight, but Be'at Hashem for many years to come. I, mean, I know everyone's now laughing in introductions to the shiru. I have this uh, thing with doing long introductions. Baruch Hashem. In Abutai Bezat Hashem, tonight, before we get into the shiur, I would like to speak about something that actually Baruch Hashem ties in with the shiur, that is something beautiful. In Abutai, that we're actually in what month? The month of Kislev. Now, in Abutai, what Arizal says, what all the Baalei Kabbalah teach, that the, the month of Kislev is actually one of the highest months that exists in the year. That we call it the month of Nisim, the month of miracles, the month of light, the month of opportunity, where it said that in the month of Kislev, a person, even with the smallest odds of succeeding, the opportunity that exists overcomes it all. That a person can completely come with the odds of having success and having victory are very small, and you can come with to a complete victory. Why? Because it's enrooted in the month of Kislev of potential for big success. And that Rabotai is where we see even the end of the month. What holiday are we going to celebrate Bat Hashem and the Cafe Bekislev? Chanukah, which we all know the story of Chanukah with a big miracle with the Hashmonaim. And against all odds, they got up and they came out victorious. That in this month, Rabotai, it is the month where we can change everything in our lives. A person can come to a complete redemption. You know what I would say in the Zohar Kadosh? We all, in preparation for Oshan and Yom Kippur, it's the month where all Jews, Bauch Hashem, are tzaddikim. 
we all talk about how it's so critical to be close to Hashem, to come close to Hashem, to go to Slichot, to study Torah in this month. Because this is the month that actually is going to decide our entire year to come. But actually the Zohar Kadu says that, yes, you are judged in the month of Elul and of Nef Tishrei, but a person can still change the judgment until when? Until Kaf Hei Bekislev. Where it said that the new year starts from when? Starts from Kaf Hei to Kaf Hei. What does that mean? It means until Kaf Hei 25 of Kislev, we are still being led in the judgment of what? Of last year. That the new judgment only puts, gets put into action in Kaf Hei Bekislev. Until the new judgment is not put in place, we can still change it completely. And that's why this month of Abotai has the potential, and like the Kubalim would say, it has the potential for a person to bring back an entire month of Yom Kippur. Because it's a month of not judgment like Rosh Hashanah, but a month of complete kindness, a month of complete opportunity. That's why Abotai is amazing that we're doing also a finishing of Zohar on the month of opportunity. What bigger opportunity to finish the entire book of Zohar together with Hashem? You know, Abotai, I wanted to hold on to this constant opportunity and we're going to continue by this with issue. We see Abotai in this week's parasha, something that is very beautiful, something that we can learn a lot from. Last week, Yaakov Avinu, Allah Shalom, the third forefather, got up and did something very uh, sneaky. Where it says that he went, him and Rivka, him and his mother came with this, this, this genius plan. That they're actually going to go and they're going to take or even steal. Because like what the Torah says, that Yitzchak, when, when Yaakov came back to, when Yaisaf came to Yitzchak, what did he say? He said, came, your brother came, Yaakov, and he took it b'mirma. He came and he stole your berachot. So we see last week's parasha, that Yaakov goes and actually steals something that, depending on your opinion, belonged to Yisav Arasha. And in this week's parasha, we see Yaakov again runs away from Yisav. So he went, he stole the barachot, and he ran. It said in the Torah, this week, Yaakov Avinu is being led to a place where he wouldn't necessarily find himself. Where was he led to? This, the mountain of what? Har? Har Amoria. The mountain where Adam Arisha was created. The mountain where Kodesh or Kodashim sits. The mountain where Abraham Avinu brought Yitzchak as a sacrifice. And it said, while Yaakov just arrived, just arrived, arrived to that place, Hashem pulled down the sun and made it dark. Yaakov sees that it's dark. What does he do? He goes, takes a few rocks, puts them under him, and goes to sleep. And while he sleeps, Torah says he starts to dream. And in this dream, he sees a sulam mutzav arza, v'ashamayim megia, v'rosho megia ad ashamayim. He sees a ladder. This ladder is a very unique ladder. That it's starting right where his feet are, and it goes up until as far as I can see to the sky. And on this ladder, what does he see? He sees angels climbing up the ladder, going up and climbing down. And it says, Malachim Olim The angels were climbing up and down, up and down, up and down. The Zohar Kadosh would ask a question. He says, Why were the angels? climbing up and down this ladder from the first place. It's a question that no one of the Mephashim actually asked. Okay, it says that they were climbing. Why? So the Zohar Kadosh Rabbi teaches us actually a little bit of a deep study that we all that Hashem will base the Shur. The Zohar Kadosh said, actually, every single person in this world is not an individual on its own. And I'll explain what do I mean. The Zohar Kadosh says, the same way, for example, we have a Rabbi Michael here, and we have a Rabbi Yossi, that are sitting down here with us. Up there in Shamayim, there is an exact duplicate. This is where I want you to, to stay, hold on with me. An exact duplicate of Rabbi Michael. We're the same way that there's Rabbi Michael sitting here, and he's sitting and teaching, studying, uh, he's sitting here with the class. There is a Michael, which is an exact copy up there. That everything that Michael does here, Michael up there does the exact same thing. When a person lifts his hand, up there they lift their hand. And we learn that where? We learn that actually from this Pasha, where it says a man, his body is here, Mutzav Arza, Ve Rosho, Megia Ada Shamaima. 
That the person, his legs are here in this world, but his rosh, his neshama is where? It's still up there. Where a person has a duplicate. Now why a duplicate? What is this duplicate? This duplicate is actually a duplicate that only does the good that a person does in this world. What does that mean? It means whenever a person has an opportunity to do good and bad, the same way that when you lift your hand, he lifts your hand, his hand, but he only lifts his hand when you're doing something good. Meaning, he does all the good you do, and he uses a person's full potential, but he doesn't copy the bad that a person does. So it's actually the perfect version of every single person that's in this room. Meaning, that the same way that there is now a person here that is sitting here, Baruch Hashem, we do sins, we, we do uh, mitzvot, we do good and bad. Up there, it's the same person, but only good. And it's a person that completely completed his cap uh, 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 capability to its max. So Abutai, it says that when the angels were going up to Shaman, they saw something that was very strange. It was something that bothered them. Where they see the duplicate that is up there of Yaakov Avinu, which is supposed to be perfect. A duplicate that actually used all the potential of Yaakov. When they come down, they see that this duplicate looks identical. Where usually the duplicate which is up there is perfect, clean, perfect example of that person. And the duplicate that is down here is a man of this world. Where it says, There's no man in the world that does mitzvot and only mitzvot and doesn't sin. Even the biggest tzadikim before. So always the duplicate that are down here are not as perfect which the ones that are up there. But the angels see something strange. They see that Yaakov Avinu, the way he looks up there is the identical version of the way he looks down there. And it said that the Zohar says that they were not able to understand how is it possible that a man used his full potential to its max and never fell and never sinned in the same way up there is the same thing that he's done. So said the angels, they didn't believe it when they saw it. So they kept on climbing up and going down, climbing up and going down, climbing up and going down. Well, Zohar said that they were so bothered that it could be possibly true that a person can keep his identical form up there and down here. Where it said that they wanted to break Yaakov's head. Where they said that it's impossible that his man, this man is so pure. If he has the exact same form, which as we know about the, our deeds keep our form clean, good deeds, or chas v'shalom, bad deeds, what do they do? They actually change our form. They change the way our body looks, not physically in the way we are, even sometimes physically. We see sometimes people where they're not... Uh, Necessarily righteous people, you see it on their eyes, you see it on their face. While other people, which are people that have a big heart, which are clean, you can see it on their face too. So the deeds actually change a person's form. So it said the angels did not believe that a person can keep that perfect form down here and up there. So they wanted to break Yaakov's head. Because they said, if this person is identical, it means that something is wrong. And if it's wrong, he shouldn't be alive. So it said when the angels came to harm Yaakov, they Yadosh Baruch came and he completely protected Yaakov and pushed away all those angels. Wow, what? <laughs> I scared myself. <laughs> Usually other people scare me. <laughs> so, why? My mess, I got scared. <laughs> so, anyway, Ma? What is it? I was as we come at Sarawatai, to go back into our, uh, to our shoe, it says that like, Kadush Baruch came and he appeared and he completely cleaned all the angels over the head of Yaakov. Where the Zohar Kadush said, who looks like a father that has his son, and there are flies that are coming and trying to go on the son. What does the father do? He comes and he does like this. It scares the flies away. And that's what Kadush Baruch did to Yaakov, to save Yaakov, you know, from the, from the angels to harm. You know, but I, I want to ask a question. What is the purpose and what is the reason of having this duplicate? Okay, we said that. The Zohar Kadosh said that every man has a double. But why? What's the purpose of Hashem keeping a perfect version down here, uh, uh, up there, and uh, down there a person that he can get up and do what he wants? What's his reason? So the Zohar Kadosh said something amazing. It said that it's in order to do something to a person after 120 years. Where after 120 years, 
We're all going to go up to Shemayim. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to say, no. Did you use all the blessings that I gave you down in this world? Did you take advantage of all the potential you had to succeed, maybe in Torah, maybe in Ma'asim Tovim, maybe even in the success of Panasa? And there, the person is going to go up, and like every person, what is he going to do? Hashem, it's not my fault that I didn't succeed. You, I am not capable. You didn't give me the opportunity. You didn't give me the capability to reach that level. So what does HaKadosh Baruch do? He goes and he calls the duplicate. He says, come here. And he brings this duplicate and he looks at, at that, that every single one of us. And he's going to tell this person, look, this is what you could have done. This is the exact copy of you, the image of you, but the image of you if you were to go and if you were to use your uh, uh, potential. Where any time that you, I gave you a good and bad choice, you chose the good. That any time you were sitting in your home and you were lazy and you didn't want to get up and you didn't want to go to study and you didn't want to go to work, you got up and you worked. That any time somebody tried to pull you down, it didn't pull you down. Or any time you felt that you were sad, you lifted your own spirit up. That is how you look if you were able to use your potential to its max. So you can't use the excuse of Hashem. You didn't give me the kelim, you didn't give me the tools, you didn't give me the, the capability to get to that point. Because the Kadosh Baruch shows you what you were able to do only if you were to just use the potential that Hashem gave you. And that abotai is something that is very big. The concept of abotai of potential. Do you know what I ask myself? Why is it that a person would have to wait after 120 years, that only after he leaves this world and he no longer has any potential, only then see what he had in his hands. Why do we have to wait until we're no longer in this world and we're no longer able to change things to see what we could have done? And why don't we get up now when we still could do? We know, but it's not even a matter of 120 years. You see a lot of time about that, people, when they get to an older age, and they sit down and say, I could have, and 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 I could have. <clears throat> that we waste so many years of our life doing what? Doing nothing. It was even a story with, uh, with uh, the brother of Rav Zusha, Rabbi Noam Elimelech. It's one of my favorite stories. Where it says with Rabbi Noam Elimelech, one time, he had a specialty where he was able to bring Neshama to close. That's what was his Neshama. Every Neshama has different traits. His Neshama was, he was a magnet for other Neshama to bring them back to Tshuva. One time his brother Azusha asked him, he said, you know, Rabbi Noam Elimelech, we know that when Adam Arishon was alive in this world, all the Neshamot in the world were where? Were inside the body of Adam. So, Rabbi Noam said, if you're a Neshama, that you have the power to bring any man back to Tshuva, and you have the power to bring any person to stop him from doing a sin, if you're a Neshama who's in Adam Arishon, how didn't you stop him from sinning? How didn't the trades that your neshama hold pull Adam Arishon from going and from bringing all this destruction to the world? So Rabbi Noam Elimech Rabotai said something that is scary. He said, because when the snake came to me in Chava and he told me to eat from the tree of knowledge, what did he tell me? He told me, he said, you know, the reason that Kadosh Baruch doesn't want you to eat from the tree it's because, no, because he knows that if you eat from the tree of knowledge, what will happen to you? You will become a god. And when I heard this, even though that I knew it wasn't true, I couldn't handle the regret of what if and what if and what if and what if. So I rather fall and I rather sin and rather take upon myself thousands of years of punishment, but not live a life of regret, a life of I could have done this, I could have done this, I could have done this. And that about is something we find in our life all the time. That a lot of the time about that we only realize the potential we have in our hands. When? When it's no longer in our hands. Because only then we see what we could have done, what the levels we were able to reach to. You know about that a lot of times when you talk to people about getting up, about working, about really exceeding, you can come to a person and tell them, no, you're very smart, why don't you be a lawyer? Or you know, you're very smart, why don't you go become a doctor? Oh, you're very smart. Why don't you go and become a Talmud Chacham? Or go and work and open up uh, the boulevard? Or do something that is uh, uh, courageous to go to, 
to, to grow, to, to do something uh, big. A lot of time, Abu Tayyip, we left with people answering us, what? What? No, if I tell you now, go become a doctor. Let's say, go become a doctor. Why can't you? Too long. Too long. Yeah. That's the only reason it's too long. Too hard, too, hard, too long. So what do other people say? Ah, you know, I'm not capable to do that. I'm not capable to go now to sign on a building. I'm not capable to go now to sit down for six years, like what he said, that he said here, to go learn to become a doctor. I'm not capable, I'm not capable. I'm not, uh, I, I, it's not in me to do that, to, to do this. You know, Abutai, there's something that I always say. That I want Abutai, everyone to hold every single day of their life because it's truly something that we can grow and we can use it as a tool. I always say, Abutai, you know, we need a box, a toolbox in our pocket at all times. Any moment that we feel that we're in need for a little bit chizuk, for a little bit strength, we have the tools in our, in our pocket ready to be used. And this Abutai is something that I want everyone to hold on to. A person should not live his life living up to his capability, but actually let a person live his life that his capability lives up to him. But a lot of the time, Abutai, we live up to where we see that we were capable. We say, I can only do this and this and this and this and this because this is what I'm capable of. And you limit yourself for what you're able to get up and to move. Why? Because you're going to live up to where your capability ends. Mm -hmm. And that's how a person limits himself completely and builds himself gates of his own uh, success. Instead of doing that, Abu Tai, we should live our lives where our capability needs to do what? Needs to live up to us. We were so courageous where we have so much potential in our hand where we go and we chase the most courageous dream, the most courageous things, and we know that capable or not, the capability will have to, 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 to catch up to us. And Rabotai is truly something that is amazing. But you hear a lot of people, Rabotai, it takes them years of wasting their life saying, I'm not capable, I'm not capable. But really the only obstacle was what? Themselves. That a concept of a person getting up and being incapable or being stopped, it's something that exists only up here in a person's head. Because capability, opportunity, strength, we don't even, we cannot even fathom, we cannot even imagine how strong we are really inside and how much capability we have to exceed our own expectations in a, in a way that we can't imagine. But we are the ones who limit ourselves. You know, this is a famous story that we all know about a lady that one time was in a car crash. Hashem A lady that was in a car crash that her son was stuck, stuck under the car or something like that. And this lady that weighs 100 pounds, when she saw her son under the car, what did she do? She went and picked up the car. And the question could be asked, Abotai, if you were to ask her 10 minutes, 10 minutes previous, do you have the capability to pick up the car? What would she answer? She answered no. Where she would put already before she even got to the situation a gate. Where Rabotai in life, a lot of the times we limit our own potential and we close our own success just from the way we feel on our, own, on, on, on our part. Where the biggest problem of Rabotai is not the world and not the opportunity and not our capability and not that a person is too tired or a person is not able to. It's the fact that we don't find in ourselves the ratson, the will to get up and to use what we have to help our own situation. You know, Abutai, Baruch Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, it, they gave me the merit to meet a lot of people. And a lot of times when I see a lot of people, which sometimes, most of the times, much older than me, they sit down and they tell me all these problems. And really, I'm not doing anything. I'm sitting down, I see it in my, in my eye, they put a mirror in front of them. Where the people, they come and you see they have so much strength. And they're able to do so much more than they think. But they completely, no, I can't. How? How am I able to do that? It's going to be too hard. Where all sometimes what it takes is a person to just look into himself and see what he's capable of and start to appreciate who he is to see how far he can go in his own life. It's a matter of, time of just not limiting oneself. And I said, about time not... Uh, not uh, once, not twice, with so many people. That the answers, the solution, the strength, the motivation, they have it within themselves. It's just a matter of, of waking it up. 
of taking it out of the dark and bringing it into the light, bringing it into a place which it is uh, visible to all to come and to see and to, and to use. And a Buddha person can't get up. Say, so, you know, Rav, you're making it sound too easy. I'm older than you. I went through so much in my life. I went through so many hardships. It's easy for a young person to get up and say, just work and work and you're capable and you're capable and you're capable. But after you've been to, through what I've been through, and after you've been through all the struggles and all the scars that I have in my skin, you know it's not so easy. But you know about those people, or Michila that I'm saying this, but they are the people that are taking the most potential and trashing. Because if we look at our hardships as things that are going to hold us back, they're going to hold us back. But our hardships is what a person goes through are actually the strongest thing that we can use to greaten our potential. That all the hardships, all the suffering, all the, 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 the things that people have been through that are actually the things where it, it, it's the dark times in his life, that abutai is what can fuel a person to go on and to reach to the highest levels. You know, abutai, today, if you ask me, what is the best thing, what is the one thing that I will never give up on in my entire life? And I want if anyone really sit down to think about it, and on my level, on my side, the one thing that I will never, in a million years, give up on, is all the hardships that I've been through on a personal level. Because every single hardship, it shapes you, it strengthens you, and it gives you the sign of what really you're capable of. Because if a person really sees all the hardships that he's been through, and he sees that he passed through it, and he's still here, then imagine what you're capable of if you get up and you start and you push from today, here and on. And that Abutai actually should be used as fuel. And that Abutai is a story of something Abutai really amazing with my father. And it said at one time, there was a Jew named Yossi. He was Israeli, lived in the valley. But, uh, he was a very unique Jew. You know, there's a lot of Baruch Hashem, uh, unique uh, people in the world. And his panasa was very strange. He didn't have a job where you go a certain hour to a certain hour, you do sales, you don't do sales. His job was what? The entire week, he would do Teshuvah. Then on Shabbat, he would go to Las Vegas. And he was very, very good at, you know, Misachek Makubiya, we call it, in the language of the, of the Gemara, of the Alakha, uh, gambling. And he would make all his partners from that. We lived off going to Las Vegas and doing, you know, there there's a lot of places where you can gamble. That's why he would make it panasa. So the entire week, huh? Very unique. Ken, very unique. So the entire week he would come to the shiurim of my father to do teshuva. Then on Shabbat he would go make his living. Now my father says that he was so Israeli where all the places of the gambling kicked him out. Why? Because he was very good at his job. He knew how to come in and how to empty out the place. We had good luck, he had mama's Jewish luck. Well, no matter what decision he made, boom, boom, boom. With well, the place he said, this man is a loss. Every time he comes, empties out all the, the, the cash that we have. So my father said that at a certain point, he was kicked out from most all the places. One day, he goes there. And he was in the last, uh, how do you call them? Casino. Casino? Uh, uh, <laughs> so he was in the last casino that he was able to go to. Suddenly, he meets a woman there. And this woman was a, a young woman, very friendly, and they started to talk. And while they're talking, they became friends, and from friends, they started to, to, to go out. But this woman was unfortunately what? She was not Jewish. So at that point, he wasn't really, uh, it didn't really change his life, the fact that he was Jewish, not Jewish. In his head, he said, I'm never going to marry her, so it's fine. It's, like, it's, it's amazing how some people can become their own poskado. They can become their own uh, writers of Shulchan Aruch. As long as you don't marry her, it's fine. That's what it says in Alakha. <laughs> Let's make, just make sure it's not what it says in Alakha. <laughs> so he said, it's okay. And like that, he was with her for two, three years. Who is this lady? The daughter of the owner of what? <laughs> of this casino. So she, he knew that he, she is the only daughter to a billionaire. So he was very happy to say that, look, I'm going out with her. And it said it. Her father, my father said that her father would spoil him so much when he bought him, as you know, the lowest sport cars. But the key, 
they made it special, made out of what? Complete gold or the diamonds. And that was the gift, like uh, the welcoming to the family. I imagine, uh, I don't know how much they cost, with a gold key. And he would drive with his gold key and put always the gold key. My father said, always oh, the shuri. Of course, he would take the gold key and make sure everyone sees it on the table. Look what I have. And that was his pride. After a couple of years, the father came to, the, to, to this Yossi and said, you know, Yossi, enough. You're with my daughter. You're playing with her. Maybe you don't have the intention to marry her. Either you commit and you marry her now or you get up and you leave. So he said, you know what? I still have a Rav, so, uh, uh, Baruch Hashem. Let me go ask my Rav what I should do. <laughs> so he came to my father. And he told my father, he said, look, Abi Yaakov, I have two options. Either I marry her, and I'm guaranteed to become a billionaire eventually. I just have to pray hard enough that he goes early, and then I, and I inherit everything, because she's the only daughter. Or I leave, and I stand with my roots, but... It's too much of a hard thing to do. You know, you're leaving the, the uh, wealth that people can't even imagine of. So he said, what do I do? So my father said, if I'm going to tell him no, he's going to end up going and doing it anyways. So my father said, that's an answer I'm not going to answer for you. That's an answer that you're going to have to really look into your nishama and see really if you're going to sell your nishama or you're going to hold on to your nishama. So go to Eret Israel, go to Arizal, go to the Kivret Tzadikim, Come back and make a decision. But I don't want you to make a decision on your own, on, on what I tell So he said, you know what, Rav, that's a good idea. Took a flight and went for two weeks to Eretz Yisrael. My father tells me, seven years from that point and on, disappeared. My father said, most probably what happened. He came back, took the decision to marry her and had the shame to come and to tell my father, I, I'm going to marry her. And I got completely forgotten. One day, my father took me to Shiva to all the tzaddikim mitzvah. And we reached, if I'm mistaken, to the Kever of Rabbi Natan Ben We arrived with all the kolel and we brought buses with us. And suddenly, I remember as a, as a kid, a man with a beard like this runs from the other side. He's crying and screaming. And he jumps to my father. And my father's looking at a rav on him. And whoever knows my father knows that that's a very rare thing to do. My father's very, very, uh, he, look, he looks like a, like a lion that's on fire. He's very, uh, you don't want to just jump on him. And this man is hugging him and uh, holding onto his shirt and crying. So my father's looking at him saying, hey, Mechila, how can I help you? So he looks at my father and he says, what? Rav, you don't remember me? So he says, no. He says, Rav, you don't remember me at all? He says, Mechila, Tzadik, I don't remember you. So my father said, he went opened up his shirt and he pulled out of under his shirt what? A golden key of a sports car. <laughs> and he told my father, I hold with this with me every single day of my life. And this is what gives me the strength to continue to do what I do. Abu Tain, what did this man do? He used the biggest challenge that he was facing in his life and he's using those challenges to fuel his success and to fuel him to move on on, 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 on on really using his potential. So a person cannot get up and say, ah, because I suffered or because I have these hardships and because I have these things that are mikhsholim, these things that, uh, that are not easy on me, I can't, I wasn't able to use my full potential. Our hardships are actually our fuel. Every single hard thing that we pass on in our life should would it should be what fueled us to truly reach to our potential. You know, Abutai, good or bad, every happy moment, every sad moment, no matter what we go through in our life, we need to know that at any given moment, we need to use our full potential. Because a time and point will come where that potential won't be in our hands anymore. And when it's not in our hands anymore, we're going to go up after 120 years and look at that double, and that devil is going to be a wealthy man that lived an entire happy life, that lived a life where he studied Torah and he was happy and he was wealthy and he had everything. And we can say we could have been that. But at the moment, we didn't use our potential. And that Abutai is a place that none of us, Chas Shalom, want to be. Abutai has any month to get up 
And for a person to decide to change things in his life and to start using his potential, whether if it's in work, whether if it's with his nefesh, with how one feels inside. Well, a lot of people, they struggle a lot with, with, uh, with, uh, with themselves in their own head. Whether if it's uh, with their health, whether if it's with, uh, with the zivug, anything in life. If there's any month of truly getting up and using our potential, it's this month, the month of Kislev. And we can see that Abutai, even with the name of the Kislev. Now Abutai, we know that all the names of the month, they came from where? They came from Bavel. The names of the month are not even necessarily Jewish names. Kislev. Why was it named Kislev? No, why? No, not Kis, no, Kis. Maybe, maybe, maybe other people try to explain it. But if we actually look at the source, why it was named Kislev, it comes from the word of Babel, of uh, Babylon, ba Babylonian, Ken? Uh, ba uh, Babylonian, Ken? Of Kislimo. What does Kislimo mean? It means oil. Oil. Why oil, Abutai? Because you know, Abutai, oil is something very unique. Oil is a sticky, wet substance that on its first glance looks useless. But oil has the potential to do what? To light a very bright light. <coughs> that Abutai is why Kislev is called Kislev. It's the month of Abutai where we can get up and truly not just use our potential, but exceed our potential and exceed what we're really able and capable of doing. So in the Mirat Abutai, the Zohar Kadosh, in the Mirat Be'at Hashem, in the month of Kislev, may HaKadosh Baruch Hu Be'at Hashem give everyone big beracha, tzlacha, l'siyat edishmaya gdola. May HaKadosh Baruch Hu Be'at Hashem always shine us the path to use our potential and to do it in the, in the right way. And may HaKadosh Baruch Hu Be'at Hashem open up all the gates and spell on us shefad bilidai. And may Be'at Hashem, the Mirat of Rabbi Chaim Pinto, stand with all of us and protect us at all times. Amen. 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 What do you mean? You're saying that he's not complete because he pushed the course? Exactly. You should have told him, I feel like Moshe Rabbeinu. Tim said it was Moshe Rabbeinu. He said Moshe Rabbeinu when he got the... So when Moshe Rabbeinu, his time came to die, he didn't want to die, it says. <coughs> if Yaakov was a complete image, or it's even said all the time, the king go through... For a second, they, they look at Gehenam. They have, they, b before they go up, they could pass by Gehenam just to see it for a second. Okay. Yaakov Avinu is the only one to grab Neshamot, exactly. So Yaakov was the only one that didn't even, uh, was so complete that, uh, that he, does, he didn't even go through that. When he thought that Yosef passed away, he thought that he broke his, his shlimut, his condition, his condition, his condition, his condition, his where would they, would actually not make him complete anymore. So that's why he was sad all those years where Yosef, we thought he was eaten. So it said, Moshe Rabbeinu, before he passed away, he didn't want to die. He said, Hashem, it's not fair that you're taking me out of this world. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, Zeh ashar le tzadikim, zeh ashar le Hashem, tzadikim ya'avar ubo. This is the gate of Hashem, all the tzadikim need to pass by. Meaning any tzadik needs to pass away, needs to leave his world and go up to the next. Why? Because there is the effect of the snake. What's the snake? The sin of the snake. So Moshe Rabbeinu said, uh, but that's not fair. I'm a tzaddik. I never did. I never sinned. Why are you putting me in this position? He said, what about Abraham Avinu? Did he sin? So Moshe Rabbeinu said, Mechila. Abraham had a son, which his name was uh, Ishmael. So Hashem said, what about Yitzchak? Yitzchak was a tzaddik. What did he sin? And he had to pass away at 7.2. So what did uh, Moshe Rabbeinu say? was very smart. What did he say? Yitzchak had who? Had a self. When he got to Yaakov, and Yaakov said, no, what about Yaakov? Yaakov didn't sin, he was complete his entire life. Why did he die? So Moshe Rabbeinu didn't have an answer. We couldn't point at anything to say that Yaakov was unperfect in a certain place. Where What was his answer, Moshe Rabbeinu? He said, you don't compare me to Yaakov. I went up to the sky, Moshe Yaakov didn't. That was his answer. But to point a finger at a place where Yaakov did not live his life with his full potential and complete himself to, to his most complete level of his, of his own personal self, we can't see.
גם בלי צדיק. זהו צדיקים? זהו? אוקיי, זהו. Now we're going to give out Be'at Hashem's Be'at. Can I ask a question? No. So I was thinking, I'd love to visit like a lot of the Kever of the Sadiqin. So if, if the physical and the spiritual, like, you know, they separate, so at that point it's just the body, right? It's just the physical body laying in the Kever. No, no, no. So actually we're compiled of not just one spiritual piece. We're compiled out of five. Where there is Neshama, Nefesh, Ruach, Chaya, Yechida. Five different pieces. When a person passes away, and you say you go to Gan Eden, it's not that they all five gather together and they all walk together to Gan Eden. Each one goes to a different place. So there's action. This is where we're going to get a little bit complicated. This is for another deeper level of, of, of Zohar. Where it says that there's Gan Eden, the Tachton, Gan Eden, the Elyon, the Tachton, the Tachton. The bottom Gan Eden, the, the, the higher Gan Eden. So it's actually different pieces. So actually there are pieces of the five that stay with the body. And they don't leave. They sit there and the Kever. Ken. The whole parasha is about potential. Yaakov used his potential to its max. When he went to the heaven, he saw his Engraved on the chariot and on the chair of Hashem. I didn't know I might have to be What's the word exactly? Achen. Achen. Why? What's Achen? Achen means Ari. 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 It, is, it really is the parasha of potential. It really is the parasha of potential. We even said last week, uh, uh, last night it was? <laughs> With, last night? Yeah. But there's a beautiful concept about uh, Yaakov Avinu. Where even Yaakov Avinu, his full potential was that he was to bring the tribes. But the original plan was that Yaakov was not supposed to bring the tribes. He, Yosef was supposed to bring the tribes. That's why Yosef was the only one that actually brought two tribes of his own. That's it, Rabotai. No more questions about Ah. Yes. How do we, um, is it possible to communicate with that higher self that's the perfect image of ourselves to bring down? There are ways we can use. So that's why, uh, like we said in the beginning, what's the beauty about the study of the Zohar Kadosh? When we study the Zohar Kadosh, we actually have a deeper understanding of ourselves, of who we are, of what we are, of how we act on. What our actions affect up there, down here. So actually there are ways where we can actually use this double to benefit us down here. So for example, Zohar Kadosh in Parashat which is my favorite Zohar, says there that a person, the simplest way you can use that double of his, that duplicate. How? In a time of tefillah. Where it says in a time of tefillah, what should a man do? He should lift his hands. I don't to lift both of my hands because then that's the continuation of the Zohar. He lifts both of his hands to Shamayim. Where he said the moment that a person lifts his hands to Shamayim at the time of Tefillah, at that moment, what does the devil do? He lifts his hands. And the moment he lifts his hands, if you look at a man's hand, how many knuckles do we, do we have? Let's count. No, count. 14 knuckles. 14 plus 14 is? 28. 28 is the gemat of koach. Strength. At the moment a person lifts his hands at the time of tefillah, his prayer actually receives big strength. Why? Because his hands are open up there to receive blessing. <coughs> and because that double is actually a part of you, who did that, who, where did all that blessing come down to? It comes down to a person. That's why if a person wants his prayers to be heard, he should lift his hands at the time of tefillah. Which is a big, big, big uh, segula, having, uh, having, our prayers, uh, having our prayers heard. Any time, any prayer or bakashot. Any time that we pray, or we do bakashot. What does that mean? Bakashot could mean, you know, Akadosh Baruch Hu Animu Parnasa, give me my zivu, give me this, give me that, I want more of this. Bakashot, you're talking to Hashem. Or tefillah, when you lift your hands to Hashem. That's why it's big segula. When we reach to Amidah, we do Shema Koleinu. We say Shema Koleinu Hashem Eloheinu. 
We say, listen to our, hear our prayers, HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Big segula according to the Kabbalah to lift our hands. Because when we lift our hands at the time we say, Shema Kolenu, our entire prayer receives that, what? That koach. That strength. With the concept of the koach can be found even with the word Yad. What's Yad? Yud, Dalit. Yud is how, how much in uh, numerical value? Ten. Dalit is in, what is it? Four. Four. Yad, Vod Yad, two Yad, two Yadaim, twenty. So you see, it's, 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 it's repetitive. It's not just uh, in one place. So yes, we can actually use this double in order to bring upon ourselves, uh, to bring upon ourselves Big Bach. Anytime we want Shefa, or we say, We're opening our hands, we say, Hashem, open your hands and give Panasa to all those who need Panasa. What do we do? Pick up our hands. Why? Because we want Hashem to give us Panasa. So when we lift our hands, our double lifts his hands too, and it's, it's like a funnel. <coughs> now, a funnel, what's a funnel? On the top is wide, and it gets shorter and shorter and shorter until it becomes very, very narrow. So what we do is we open up the funnel up there and we concentrate all the bacha to, to one place. That's why anytime we eat panasa, we open our lift our hands. Or we do pekat amazon. We open our hands again. We do amotzi. Why do we open our hands? Because it's the bacha for the entire week is coming down. So anytime we need our prayers to be heard, we lift our hands. Huh? 